Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Meg Terrell. I'm Adam Feuerstein. And I'm Damian Garde. It's Thursday, April 6th, and here's what we're going to talk about this week. How did everything go so wrong for Illumina? STAT's Matt Herbert joins us to explain how the biggest company in genome sequencing lost the faith of shareholders and painted itself into a corner. We'll also discuss the latest news in the life sciences, including a look at what's ahead in biotech for the second quarter of the year, which we've just begun, and why Johnson & Johnson investors are happy the company is proposing to pay $9 billion to settle talc lawsuits. But first, a word from our sponsor. I'm Stat Branded Content Editor, Jesse McQuarters. With its talent, lab space, and robust startup ecosystem, New York City is now a global life sciences hub. I'm joined by Sue Rosenthal, SVP of Life Sciences and Healthcare at New York City Economic Development Corporation, to hear more about New York's life sciences capabilities. Sue, can you tell us about this competitive edge that New York has? New York City has nine premier academic medical centers and over $2.5 billion of NIH funding that we've secured recently. The city has a thriving ecosystem for life sciences. Part of that is that we're committed to nurturing and growing the city's diverse and skilled talent with initiatives like the LifeSign New York City Internship Program, which has paired over 600 interns with at least 160 host companies. And how can people find out more? The best place is online at lifesci.nyc. L-I-F-E-S-C-I dot N-Y-C. So as we speak, it is the early days of April, which means it is the early days of the second quarter of 2023. And um, Adam, consulting the calendar that, that you are for us in so many ways, it is poised to be potentially a, a momentous quarter indeed for yes. the drug industry. What are some of the things on the calendar that, that make that the case? Right, the second quarter being April, May, and June, Damien. Um, the uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on, which is good. I mean, you know, being busy is is good for everybody. Uh, and so, yeah, I put together kind of a calendar, a list of catalysts that are coming up for the next three months. And uh, one of the more important things, and uh, that 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 we're waiting for, uh, we talk a lot about Alzheimer's on this podcast. We write a lot about Alzheimer's at Stat. Uh, Eli Lilly has a very important phase three study of its uh, amyloid targeted antibody that's called denanumab. Uh, and uh, those results from a phase three study will be coming out, I think probably in the next month or two. I was, I was looking over some analyst notes this morning trying to get a better timeline. And it seems like people are expecting it kind of April, May. Um, and this these data will really tell the tale of denanumab and whether or not you know the drug A obviously lowers uh, amyloid, those toxic protein plaques that that get into the brain and kill neurons and you know more importantly whether that leads to improvement or or the I should say the slowing of of disease progression in patients with early uh, early uh, Alzheimer's so we're at this moment where the pendulum has swung so far on the amyloid hypothesis from nothing <laughs> has ever worked for decades <laughs> exactly. to things are going well but like it's really hard to look at the history of amyloid you know, targeted drugs and phase three trials and like feel totally optimistic about this. Like what is the vibe kind of going into this, Adam? I think the vibe is I think people are fairly confident. I think the questions that come up are really around the magnitude of the benefit. So, you know, how 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 much slowing of disease progression do we see from denanumab? Uh, and obviously people will be comparing those results to the results from the ASI biogen drug, Lecambi, which is already on the market because uh, that's what everyone does, right? We'll, we will, even though those drugs are not being compared to each other in the study, people will make cross-trial comparisons. The other issue is is always safety. Uh, you know, with these amyloid lowering uh, uh, antibodies, the, the biggest side effect, that the most worrisome side effect that people that people look at is that brain swelling and hemorrhaging called aria. Uh, and so we will be paying very close attention to the the aria rates, the rates of that brain swelling in the patients. Uh, in the denanumab study to just kind of see, you know, that again, that risk benefit equation and sort of where it, you know, where it comes out. So the other tentpole data set that we're expecting likely in the next quarter, um, if not this summer, is results from a very large study of Novo Nordisk semaglutide, commonly known as Ozempic, although in this case, Wegovi, because this study is looking at whether treatment with Wegovi 
uh, for patients diagnosed with obesity actually leads to lower rates of cardiovascular events is kind of the jargon, meaning heart attacks, strokes, or death um, after years of taking this medicine, which we know has can have a dramatic effect on people's body weight, but it remains to be seen whether those effects translate to long-term health. And it's kind of hard to to overstate how big the results of this study will be, not just for this particular medicine's commercial future, but now that Ozempic and GLP-1 drugs have become a cultural phenomenon. The headlines coming out of this trial are likely to sway. I mean, they're going to make headlines around the wor- the country, if not the world, and will swing how people perceive the onset or the, the growing popularity of this drug and those to come. In terms of, I, I mean, the, the conversation has gone in so many directions to this point, but if there's definitive data suggesting either one, that it does have long-term health benefits, or two, that it doesn't, or that they're murky or somewhere in between, that's really going to pivot how we talk about the future of these medicines. Yeah. So Novo calls this a select study, Damien. Uh, 17,500 participants uh, were enrolled. And these are people who uh, were either overweight and obese. Uh, they also had to have uh, some form of pre-existing heart disease. And then, you know, like, as you said, they're randomized uh, to receive a weekly uh, or weekly injections of Wegovy or a matching placebo. Um, super important data readout. You know, you're seeing a lot of analyst notes kind of trying to uh, not necessarily predict the outcome, but kind of looking at what different, you know, different risk reductions might be and what that might mean for sales. Um, you know, uh, we'll obviously be covering uh, the results uh, that that come out and, you know, huge, huge commercial implications, like you said. I mean, if, you know, if the study is as strong as people hope for, it really will open the commercial floodgates for these GLP-1 uh, weight loss drugs. How long have they been running this trial? Because I think that's, as Amy was saying, you know, there's such a cultural conversation, obviously, going on around these drugs for weight loss. Um, Of course, this is the only one actually approved for obesity. Um, There are others like Ozempic approved for type 2 diabetes and Lily's Mount Jaro approved for type 2 diabetes. They're waiting for FDA approval for the same compound um, in obesity. Um, You know, but there's this question, you know, people talk about, there's sort of understood that losing weight for most people or some people should result in changed health outcomes. That's sort of the, you know, accepted medical stance on things. But this is actually asking and hopefully answering that question. And, you know, how long are they following people to see if losing, a, you know, a certain amount of weight? I just checked, actually, while you were asking the question, because I didn't <laughs> I know you myself. a long preamble to look it up. You did, and I appreciate that, because I was able to uh, use the Google and figure this out. Um, it looks like, you know, this study started in the end of 2018. So okay. this is a this is they've been running the study. And, you know, that's what's interesting about these cardiovascular outcome studies, right? Because they take a long time. They first of all, you have to enroll tens of thousands of patients, like we said, 17,500 patients. These are huge trials. And this kind of underscores why this market is like a you know, we mentioned this last week. This is a big pharma market because you need a lot of money. Uh, to run these very large studies. And then they take a long time because you are looking at outcomes. You have to, you know, you essentially, I mean, it sounds weird, but you sort of have to wait for people to have one of these events, whether they have a heart attack or a stroke or they or they have a cardiovascular related death or something. You know, that's what you're looking for. And you have to have a certain number of events that take place in the study in order to do the analysis. So that's why these run, you know, five, six, seven years. Um, and, you know, but that, that does, does give you some really definitive data at the end of a study. And so there's obviously a lot riding on this, you know, for Novo Nordisk in terms of you know, reimbursement for the medicine. Um, you know, our payers going to pay for this once they see that there are you know reductions in heart health risk uh, when you take this medicine, and it's not something that is perceived to be you know cosmetic. You know, weight loss drugs. What are the expectations about whether this will you know show that kind of benefit, the magnitude of the benefit, and if it doesn't, what happens to these drugs, or at least this drug, because we have seen the benefit for Ozempic and type two diabetes. No, it's a great question. I mean, as as you mentioned, the conventional wisdom is and has been that long-term reductions in weight, especially dramatic reductions in weight, it would follow logic that they would lead to reductions in cardiovascular risk. But there has been no, you know, prospective randomized trial to investigate that. And that's why this is so interesting. The presumption is that it will 
succeed for a multitude of reasons, including that that conventional wisdom, but also because, as Adam mentioned, the patients enrolled here have existing cardiovascular issues. So this is a population that is higher risk for these kinds of events to begin with, which, you know, also to Adam's point, you need these events to occur in order to do the analysis um, to determine whether the drug was successful. And by virtue of being that population versus just anyone who fits the diagnosable criteria for obesity, that should tilt the odds uh, of the study in the drug's favor. But of course, nobody knows. I mean, that's that's the point of all this consternation is that we are basing this off of some pretty good science and a lot of conventional wisdom, but we're in uncharted territory. And so if the results are negative, outwardly negative, I think that could throw a lot of these conversations asunder, especially in the business sense, as you mentioned, with Novo Nordisk's attempts to broaden the reimbursement for this medicine. It would be very easy for a payer and insurance company to point to negative data from this trial and saying, why should we pay for this? You're basically, you know, this is a cosmetic product that you're marketing and, and that doesn't fit within like the the goals of this. So that would be conceivably disastrous for, for Novo Nordisk. I mean, obviously the demand for this medicine is so strong, they've had shortages in in recent months, but the potential for it, at least according to analysts, is that this will be a 60 to $100 billion market. And those figures are predicated on this trial and other trials like it in the future succeeding, reimbursement being kind of an undeniable fait accompli for a lot of these insurance companies and these becoming, you know, as we've said before, like the new Lipitor kind of level of pharmaceutical product. And all of that, I don't want to say it all hangs in the balance because there are other medicines and there are other trials, but at least in the short term, this is the first major test of that hypothesis. I think one other thing that'll be really fascinating to think about out of these results is how much can they be extrapolated to, you know, an entire population of people. Like, as you said, like they're the patients in this study, it's set up, you know, to try to show this benefit, obviously. And and patients uh, are not only of a certain BMI, but have, you know, some heart risk already built in. Everybody taking this medicine may not fit that category. And yet you could see how, you know, people will take away big sort of, you know, things from this study to say, okay, losing weight will reduce your heart attack risk or whatever it is, whereas it might not be the case for everybody that they need to lose weight or whatever. So I, yeah. I think the conversation around these is going to just be really, you know, it, it, it's changing it so quickly um, how a whole culture around, you know, fat and weight loss and all of this stuff uh, that it, it's sort of mind boggling to watch. That's where the magic of big pharma marketing comes in. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that because but to your point though right that's what they will do right is that they will you know you will extrapolate these results to a much broader you know population of people uh to maximize sales and and you know if, if the if the results are positive that's exactly what we will see happen so moving on there was some movement in the uh J&J &J talcum powder lawsuit uh this week Meg you covered it on CNBC what what's going on yeah, so we all remember the infamous Texas two-step, or maybe we don't, but uh, this was Johnson & Johnson's attempt to sort of hive off its talc liabilities, thousands of claims from patients saying they had used J&J's talc baby powder uh, for years at a time and that it caused their cancer. Um, J&J disputes these claims, uh, but there were so many of them and they were sort of battling them one by one and they were losing some, they were winning some, this was getting very expensive. They tried to sort of spin these liabilities out into a separate company and file that company for bankruptcy, supported by $2 billion in a sort of proposed settlement offer for all of these claims. That bankruptcy failed. And we talked about that in a previous um, episode. It went through the court system and an appeals court said, this isn't how bankruptcy works. J&J &J is an extremely <laughs> financially solvent company, and it is clearly attached to this thing that it is trying to sort of split off from itself. This this company isn't in financial distress. Uh, and so that failed. They went back to the drawing board, and now they've come out with this proposal to increase the settlement offer to $8.9 billion. Uh, and the difference this time is that they say more than 60,000 claimants have agreed um, to this settlement proposal. Now, my understanding is that there are something like 100,000 claimants, and they have to get 75% of them to vote in favor of this proposal in order for it to be accepted. And then, you know, this whole thing has to sort of be accepted by the courts as well. So they've refiled for bankruptcy with this higher proposal offer. 
J&J stock went up on this because there was just a concern this would go on for an incredibly long period of time and cost even more than $9 billion. So, you know, the stock rises on a $9 billion settlement. It shows you how much this was really weighing on Johnson & Johnson. However, Wells Fargo's Larry Beagleson put out a note the night that this information came out saying their legal expert gives us a 50-50 chance of working. There are still sort of legal questions here, like J&J says it addressed the court's concerns about, you know, why this did not meet the bankruptcy threshold. They've sort of changed things around so that this does meet the bankruptcy threshold. But I think the facts are plainly clear that J&J is still the company associated with this other company and J&J is still extremely financially solvent. So, you know, I'm kind of interested in whether that even sees a legal test. I'm not sure it will, you know, if the settlement offer is sort of accepted. Um, but this is going to play out over the next few months and perhaps be resolved this summer um, if, you know, enough people vote in favor of it. J&J is pretty confident this should sort of wrap things up. But it's been... Really fascinating episode to watch. You know, it's a billion here, a billion there. I mean, to J and J, what's a what's a few billion, right? right? And importantly, we should say, J and J is not accepting any you know admission of wrongdoing here. It still disputes the claims, but it, it was saying this was just taking so long and costing so much. It wants to wrap it up, so that's why it's doing this. It sort of reminds me of uh, the the season opener of Succession, where the kids are thinking about buying Pierce. You know. What's seven billion, eight billion, ten billion? <laughs> it's just it's just a couple of more bills. That's all it is. For decades now, the genome sequencing giant Illumina has been one of the enduring success stories in the life sciences, a company that figured out how to corner the market on shovels during a gold rush. But Illumina's dominance in the market for sequencers has been slipping in recent years, and now, thanks to a bold gamble that seems to have gone awry, the company has fallen into the crosshairs of an activist investor and suddenly seems to be in the most precarious position in its history. Stats' Matthew Herper has been covering Illumina throughout its rise and into what's starting to look like a possible fall, at least from a stock perspective, and he joins us now to talk about it. Matt, welcome back to the podcast. Always great to be here. So, Matt, let's start with uh, the news from this week, which uh, I guess came from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, what did they rule? Illumina did something that I don't think we see very often, if ever, which is they decided to make a big acquisition, $7, 8000000000 billion acquisition, before they had regulatory clearance. And European regulators have been saying they might have to unwind this deal. But the F there had been a ruling that said that the FTC wasn't going to do that. The FTC overruled that ruling and told them that they are going to need to divest this company they bought called Grail, which is a cancer diagnostics company. And uh, that will, of course, be appealed, but it kind of plays into the arguments of Carl Icahn, the activist investor, who has been publicly saying that he would like the CEO replaced. He wants to add seats to the board and he wants Illumina to give up on owning Grail. So it's probably worth zooming in on Grail because acquiring it, as you just said, is is the decision that pushed the company to this position it finds itself in now. What does Grail do and why did Illumina believe that it was worth paying not only $8 billion for, but closing that acquisition without the blessing of the regulators who have to give their blessing for acquisitions? So Grail's a really amazing idea that was actually initially spun out of Illumina. It's actually an Illumina spin out. And the the idea behind the company is to uh, find little bits of DNA sequence in the blood that allow you to identify early when people have cancer. It would be a screening blood test for cancer. And so that you would pick up cancers you wouldn't treat. And there is, there's been some data now that shows that it does work. People debate about, you know, the things you debate about tests, the specificity, and there's been a bit of a soft launch of the test in the US. It's available but not reimbursed and that sort of thing. And Illumina viewed this as a really big, potentially the biggest DNA sequencing market. And so the idea was that you buy Grail and instead of just selling picks and shovels, you own the whole gold rush. So they thought the opportunity was so big that it was worth paying for. They did buy kind of at the top of the market before everything fell apart, back when it was pretty easy to raise money. And there were circumstances about how the deal was written that if they didn't close, they were going to lose it. 
Uh, but that did mean that they went ahead without the regulatory approvals that companies would usually seek before closing a deal. And that has led them to this current situation where you've got Carl Icahn, you know, one of the storied sort of activist investors that runs these really nasty proxy fights. I mean, if you read the letters that they have been writing about Illumina, they're very colorful. Um, it's not sort of a polite activist coming in here saying, you know, we're, we've got some questions. We think we have some ideas for how we could fix things. It's like... No, he's literally coming out and saying that the that the CEO should be replaced. I mean, he is... And he's he's calling the uh, he's calling almost to the point of name calling. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think one of his first things was something's rotten in the state of Illumina. Um, so let's talk about that CEO replacement, because you covered the previous CEO of Illumina, Jay Flatley, for a long time. Tell us about him and, um, you know, this idea now that Carl Icahn has raised about him potentially coming back. The thing that was amazing about Flatley's tenure at Illumina was, I mean, I remember meeting the guy at Pete's Tavern in New York 20 years ago, and he had this little company that was going to take on what was then a giant called Affymetrics, which nobody remembers. And then he had this idea that he was getting into the, going to get into this DNA sequencing business, and he bought this UK technology, and everyone said it wasn't going to work. And not only did it work, but they were able to... They didn't make big leaps in technology. What they did was they took this technology and they kept improving it incrementally. And other companies with new technologies would come along and say they were going to replace Illumina. PacBio, which is still around, said that. And there was Ion Torrent. There were all these kind of neat different ideas. And they could never catch up to the Illumina machines. The Illumina machines were faster and cheaper and ended up with almost a near total monopoly on DNA sequencing, except for some specialized uses, like when you want really long stretches of DNA and just not the little short ones these machines read out. So it was just a very impressive execution story for all that time. Um, and in a way, even though it's a, a DNA sequencing is a pretty cool, sexy thing, they were kind of not a sexy company. They reminded you of a bit of a chip maker or something. Like it was very, it was very, very much an engineering story. Um, Francis was brought in to replace Flatley, who had been the CEO for most of Illumina's history, and kind of at a time when there was starting to be some more competition. Now, Illumina is still super dominant in DNA sequencing. Uh, a lot of the problems with the DNA sequencing market more have to do with people just aren't buying as much as they were. You know, you take the, we went from the $100,000 genome to the $1,000 genome or something along that order. And since then, we've been going from a thousand to approaching a hundred, and people debate exactly where they are. You start to have that; it starts to be harder to wring synergy out of that. So that's. But Jay is the CEO who kind of had a legendary tenure that people on Wall Street are going to remember very fondly. Illumina was a very, very good stock to own for a long time. And it hasn't been. It's down quite a bit from when this decision to buy Grail was made. Um, and a lot of investors seem to agree with Icon, and the stock went up a bunch when Icon came in. So the relationship between Jay Flatley and Francis D'Souza is really kind of fascinating because, like you said, Matt, you know, Jay Flatley is this legendary CEO running Illumina for all these years. He actually brought Francis D'Souza into Illumina. And then D'Souza eventually replaced Flatley as the CEO. But more recently, in comments made in particular in January to the Financial Times, Jay Flatley has criticized the decision, or at least the timing and the way that the acquisition of Grail was conducted and done by D'Souza. What do you make of that criticism? I think Jay's sitting there looking at his legacy and worrying about what's going to happen to it. Um, it's not clear whether Carl Icahn has actually talked to Jay Flatley or whether Jay Flatley has agreed to be drafted to come back. But um, those quotes from the FT certainly are an indicator that, you know, there was kind of a, Jay was there as chairman of the board when Francis first came, and then there was kind of a an exodus. And um, he may not agree with some of the decisions that are being made, to be put bluntly. And another thing that's going to play into this is this is the second time that D'Souza has tried to accomplish a big acquisition, a potentially transformative acquisition, and run into these kind of 
regulatory barriers. And aluminum makes ar a lot of arguments that they couldn't have known that they were going to run into these regulatory problems they did. But the optics of that are not going to be good. You know, it was they tried to buy Pack Bio and had to abandon the deal. And now they're trying to buy Grail and may have to abandon the deal at what could be a loss of billions of dollars, because if you have to spin it back out now, it's going to be worth a lot less. And uh, it doesn't look great. And Jay Flatley is not a guy who ran a series of startups. He ran Illumina for 20 years or so. I, I can't imagine not caring. So looking at this from D'Souza's perspective, or just Illumina management's perspective, as you mentioned, the problem in antitrust terms with the Grail deal in the eyes of well, the only eyes that matter, which is the regulators who sign off on this, is that Illumina sells machines to competitors of Grail. And so if they acquired Grail, you would have an anti-competitive concern that they would give sweetheart deals to a company that they own that competes with their customers. And that's not the kind of thing that regulators want to see. But when you look at Illumina's core business of sequencers, as you mentioned, this, this product slash service that is largely becoming commoditized, the prices go down, you know, demand may fluctuate, but it's not exactly a growth industry. If you're Illumina and you virtually monopolize that, how do you grow if regulators have established that you are penned in from acquiring companies like Grail? Well, look, if any of the liquid biopsy cancer screening companies, Grail or any of the competitors that are nipping sort of at its heels, and Illumina insists they're far, far behind, but there are a bunch of really interesting ones. If any of those succeed, and we all start getting blood tests for cancer every year that involve a lot of DNA sequencing, um, going to sell a lot of DNA sequencers. And one of the things that's interesting about DNA sequencing for the entire time that it's been covered is we've been waiting for a big medical inflection point, right? The gene, the dream for a while is that every baby would be sequenced, right? Or that already, if you have cancer, sequencing is done, but it's of specific genes. What if you start repeatedly sequencing the whole cancer genome? And there are these huge opportunities. So I wouldn't say that I'd agree that that sequencing is commoditized, but getting through that gating point where you get this kind of forecast explosion of use has been tough. Um, and so, yeah, the idea was that you'd get this new product, which would have a higher margin. And yes, owning both, even if you have firewalls, the technical expertise of having the sequencing people in-house, probably one of the challenges for these cancer tests is how do you make them cheap enough? So that hand in glove relationship could certainly work. And re but regulators are seeing it as anti-competitive. Essentially, if you Illumina says, well, if you don't back Grail, we'll never get one of these tests. And regulators say, well, if we do, it, you're going to be the only game in town. So, Meg, there is precedent or corporate precedent for old CEO to leave, new CEO to get into trouble, replaced by old CEO, right? Well, that was something that we were talking about. I mean, it really feels like a sort of Bob Iger, Bob Chapek, Disney situation, which is also sort of funny because um, Francis D'Souza, the current CEO of Illumina, is on the Disney board. But, you know, thinking about the storied former CEO of Jay Flatley, is he the Bob Iger in this situation? And, you know, one of the things that's been sort of remarkable about watching the whole Disney situation is that Bob Iger has not exactly shied away from criticizing Bob Chapek, the you know CEO who came in and then abruptly, you know, departed and was replaced by Bob Iger again. And, you know, just going back to that FT article, because these these comments from Jay Flatley are, are sort of surprising, I think. Um, you know, he, he tells the FT about the Grail acquisition. If they'd waited a year, then it would have been a $2 billion acquisition. It was an $8 billion one. Um, in that, was, retrospect, that was a great comment. I love that one. Yeah. He says, in retrospect, it would have been better to wait and realize that the market was sizzling hot at the time and therefore it was overpriced. They write, Flatley, who persuaded D'Souza to join Illumina in 2013, told the Financial Times he did not think the deal was a strategic mistake, but operationally it had not gone the way management had hoped. It is a, quote, huge disappointment, unquote, and investors want it spun back out, he said. Uh, this goes on. Some investors, this is a quote, frankly, don't care how much Illumina is going to get for it. In some ways, it's kind of a sunk cost. If they can spit it back out, then the earnings numbers get back to where they should be. If nothing happens on this in the next year, I think the grumbling will probably get louder. Francis is at the point of that spear, 
unquote. That, that is a quote from Jay Flatley. Jay Flatley, who is often not particularly quotable. So one would think he planned that. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's just a curious situation. You know, it almost seems like reading this, he does want to come back. It's just sort of surprising to hear former CEOs. Oh, I'm not saying that he doesn't want to come back. I'm just saying that we don't know or that he may be in a decision process about that. I mean, you do wonder whether Carl Icahn read the, you know, has a a subscription to the Financial Times and read, read the story and thought to himself, we need to bring Jay Flatley back. To Illumina. Well, I mean, anyone who studied, who'd followed Illumina, their reaction to trouble is going to be, well, can we bring Jay Flatley back? I don't know if it's the right solution in any case, because, you know, you can never go home again, but it's not, there's not another Illumina CEO you can bring back. There's only the one guy. Um, it's not, it's not a company that had a string of people who ran it. And there's not, like an obvious person on the management team who you think if you remove Francis, well, this is who the job goes to, I think. So I think that feeds into that. I mean, I think Icon's real um, – you know, Icon wants the stock to go up. He sees it as a a stock that has fallen and – and that – that's what he looks for. He looks for stocks that are down and – that through management change, you can get investors in- interested again. Um, so I think he's looking for anything that can kind of push management to to change things and agree to some changes. Uh, you know, the aluminum ma- management has to be under some pretty intense pressure. The stock is down a lot. Investors don't love this deal. Even the ones who did, I, I think Icon's arguments um, of how long do you want to fight two governments and with what money <laughs> um, are going to ring true for some people? The question for Icon is, you know, winning proxy fights isn't easy. So, uh, you know, in getting investors to, to vote against management is sometimes not easy, especially when there are a lot of big investors who would rather just be hands off. So can he convince them that if they go his way, if they vote for his directors, that they will, uh, that things will improve and that it's worth making that kind of investment. I also, you know, just thinking about this from a broader perspective, Carl Icahn's nominated three people to the board. He he seemed to indicate in an interview on CNBC with Scott Wapner that the board would become 12 from nine. So maybe they're not necessarily replacing people directly, trying to replace, you know, a third of the board, but maybe expand No, he's it. trying to add, not replace. Right. That's and correct. so, you know, he's not taking over the company. Like, he's not going to have a majority of the board. But, like, adding three icon sort of deputy-type people who are not, you know, focused in anything that Illumina does in healthcare and science and data privacy and technology, any of that stuff. Are there implications to – you know, the role that Illumina plays in science and society and, the, you know, how much data it has. Like, Matt, it probably has both of our genomes, right? Like, it's got this really sensitive, you know, data set, giant data set. I mean, Craig Venter has my genome, too. So, like, I, you know. Your genome's just everywhere. But, yeah, I mean, what are the implications of Carl Icahn, you know, having that kind of control over a company like this? Are there implications of that? I don't know that there are. Um, I don't really believe that that having those icons, I mean, Illumina argues they don't have expertise, but I think that the argument icons making, I mean, he, in his initial letter, he actually set it out. Well, like, imagine that this wasn't a DNA sequencing company. Imagine it's a venture capital fund. You'd spun off this venture capital fund and then you bought it for this much more, but it's actually only worth this. And then regulators say you can't buy it. And their argument, his argument is that the board has not shown judgment about basic business. You know, he does his his basic from New York thing and you know, this is this is actually all really simple. Um I mean, Illumina does have a lot of data and it touches a lot of data. Um there have been security issues with some of that data um in the past recent memory. Um but I don't think that the addition or subtraction of people from the board really directly impacts that. Um, Icon seems to be saying that he thinks that just if there were a few more skeptics in the room and in the mix, that uh, that the company's performance could improve a lot. 
I mean, you also have to think, when does adding three seats on a board cause the stock to go up? Um, only if the only if there, there are really voices missing does that happen. Matt, thanks for joining us. Adam, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>that does it for another episode of the read out loud thank you to Teresa gaffney for producing this week's episode our senior producers are hyacinth abonado and Alyssa ambrose our executive producer is rick burke and our theme music is by brian joel we'd love to hear from you tell us what you like about this week's episode what you didn't like and whether you think jay flatley is going to take over as the ceo of illumina once again you can do all that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. See you next week.